Once there was a kingdom known as paradise. It wasn't known as paradise because it was any more beautiful than any other kingdom, but rather because of the way its citizens treated one another with compassion and with fairness. And the tone was set by the king himself, who knew that the way he treated his subjects would influence the way they treated one another. And so he treated them with love, kindness. The king died and his son, the prince, ascended the throne in his place. And the prince was nothing like his father. He was heartless. One day, two of his advisors entered the throne room and said, Your Majesty, in a corner of the kingdom, a famine has struck. The people are dying of hunger. The prince reached to the right of his throne into a bowl of fruit and took out an apple and took a bite. And he said, well, I have plenty of food. I'm sorry if they're dying of hunger, but it's just not my problem. And with that, the two advisors turned to go. No sooner had they left than two others entered and said, Your Majesty, in another corner of the kingdom, a drought has struck. The people are dying of thirst. They have nothing to drink. They'll perish if we don't help them. The prince this time reached to the left of his throne and poured himself a tall glass of water and took a sip and he said, Well, I have plenty to drink. I'm sorry if they're dying of thirst, but it's just not my problem. Well, pretty soon, all the citizens of the realm began treating one another in just the same way, heartlessly. No one could even remember what the kingdom used to be like or why it had once been known as paradise. No one except for one man, an old fisherman, who determined that he was going to teach the people and this prince a lesson. And so he dragged his old fishing boat to the center of the harbor and docked it where everyone could see it. And there he began to work on it, sanding and painting, sanding and painting, day in and day out. And the people came to look and they said, Fisherman, what is it that you're doing? And the fisherman responded, well, I'm turning my old fishing boat into a yacht. How wonderful, the people said. Perhaps when it's done, all of us can come aboard and take a ride. And the fisherman said, of course, when it's done, everyone will be welcome aboard. And so the months passed and the work continued. And by late spring, early summer, the yacht was complete, glistening in the harbor. And one summer morning, the fisherman fulfilled his promise. He invited everyone who wanted to come aboard to do so, to take a sail in the morning sun. And so many did. Even the prince came aboard. The fisherman untied the yacht, brought it out to the center of the harbor, and dropped anchor. He invited people to open up their picnic baskets and enjoy lunch, even to take a swim. And they did. Well, along about 2 o'clock, the wind began to pick up and the boat began to rock and a few of the passengers said to the fisherman, you know, fisherman, it's been a lovely morning. Perhaps it's about time for us to go back to shore. And the fisherman said, of course. There's just one thing I must do first. And with that, he went below deck and came back with a drill. And he positioned himself in the middle of the boat and he began to drill a hole in the middle of the boat. The passengers began to panic. They didn't know what to do. Someone said, go get the prince. He'll know what to do. So they went and they found the prince who was sunning himself on the foredeck. And they brought him back to speak to the fisherman. And he said in his most royal tones, fisherman, what are you doing? fisherman responded, well, I'm drilling a hole. Why are you drilling a hole? Well, it's my boat and it's my drill and I can do what I please. 
No, you can't, said the prince. His royal tones were beginning to disappear. You can't drill a hole in the boat. Don't you know that if you drill a hole in the boat, water will come into the boat and, and the boat will sink? And I can't swim and I don't want to drown. You can't swim. You don't want to drown. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just not my problem. What do you mean it's not your problem? Of course it's your problem. Can't you see that if I have a problem, you have a problem? And if you have a problem, I have a problem? And if anybody has a problem, everybody has a problem? Because we're all in the same boat. <laughs> Dear friends, last Sunday morning, in the wake of the Charlottesville tragedy, I was honored to stand beside Dr. Calvin Butts and address our friends at Harlem's Abyssinian Baptist Church. And I told that story based on Shimon Bar Yochai's admonition that if one person drills a hole in the bottom of a boat, even if it's beneath his own seat, the whole boat still sinks. We are all in the same boat. We felt it after yesterday's atrocity in Spain, another attack by radicalized Islamists on Western democracies, the victims representing more than 30 countries, so many French. And we felt it after last weekend's horror in Virginia. Tonight I will speak more about Charlottesville than Barcelona, though three truths emerge from both calamities. First, we must call terrorism what it is, without equivocation. Second, there exist perverse ideologies at home and abroad that deny our common humanity and employ fear to get us to do the same. And third, no matter our ethnicity or gender identity, our color or our creed, we are all in the same boat. We should be clear about what drew last weekend's crowd of Klansmen and neo-Nazis to Virginia. Racism. The statue of General Robert E. Lee is not just another icon. It stands as a bitter reminder of the slavery of yesterday and the institutionalized racism of today. But bigots are equal opportunity haters. The rally's organizer, Jason Kessler, is also notorious for his anti-immigrant pronouncements. The marchers also came armed with anti-Semitic placards and chanted anti-Semitic slogans. Three brandishing semi-automatic rifles intimidated worshipers at the local synagogue, Congregation Beth Israel, which requested police protection but received none. We are all in the same boat. And as Dr. King reminded us, if we don't stand together as brothers and sisters, we will perish together as fools. I told those gathered on Sunday that I don't hold President Trump responsible for every act of hate that occurs under his watch. But I sure do hold him accountable for how he responds. And last Saturday's response, on which he has since doubled down, equating the many sides involved as if the white supremacists and neo-Nazis occupied the same moral footing as those who stood against them, was an unconscionable disgrace. Mr. President, you cannot hope to tamp down the fires of hate with one hand while stoking them with the other. Your continued assault on political correctness, which risks desensitizing the many to the concerns of the few, and your aversion to identity politics downplaying focus on those concerns, has energized an assortment of bigots and given license to their expressions of hate you are uniquely positioned but painfully slow to denounce. Your failure during the campaign to repudiate promptly David Duke's support emboldened those who thought hey, now maybe we can get away with this stuff. 
and now they are. As legislators on both sides of the aisle have made clear, this is not a matter anymore of political left and right, but of moral right and wrong. And we are all in the same boat. So just as the grief of the victims in Barcelona is our grief, and the anxiety of the Jewish community of Charlottesville is our anxiety, so the concerns of American Muslims for their physical safety in this moment of suspicion and mistrust must be our concerns, and the anguish of immigrant children over the potential deportation of their parents must be our anguish. The outrage of the transgender community over the rollback of their protections must be our outrage, and the fears of African Americans when confronted by police must be our fears. In the wake of Saturday's violence, I recalled an interview with Hetty Epstein, a Holocaust survivor who was arrested on the streets of Ferguson protesting the police shooting of Michael Brown. She spoke of how, on arriving in the United States in 1948, she was stunned by Southern racism. She knew what we know. Anti-Semitism, racism, Islamophobia, homophobia, hatred of the other, all emanate from the same pathology, the failure to discern in those who are different our common humanity. As people of faith, we understand that God fashioned us from the same first person to remind us that we are all brothers and sisters. Therefore, no one should ever say to another, my lineage is greater than yours. Jewish tradition teaches that the angels in heaven directed God to make Adam with bits of clay from all over the earth so that none should ever say, my ethnicity is greater than yours, and that the clay should be a varying shade so that none could say, my color is superior to yours. One of the goals of terrorism in Spain as in Virginia is to sow in us enough suspicion and fear that we forget where we came from and that the same divine spark that animated the first human being burns in us all. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion, Nelson Mandela once said. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. If I have a problem, you have a problem. And if you have a problem, I have a problem. And if anyone has a problem, everyone has a problem because we're all in the same boat. The prince repeated the words to himself, finally understanding. The fishermen returned the boat to shore and everyone disembarked. From that day forward, the prince ruled his land with justice and kindness, and the kingdom was paradise once again.